This is episode 83 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and my guest tonight is making his third appearance on the podcast. He's the host of the Tough Call podcast and a contributor for heavyhockey.com, Josh Bolton. Josh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I was trying to remember if it was two or three. Uh, Yeah, I'm glad to be back on the show. I love it. I love talking to you. Yeah, we had two good episodes last season. Uh, It's been almost 10 months since I've had you back on, so... Uh, I know you also had a minor hockey meeting before this, so I appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast tonight. And uh, just before we get into any Oilers talk, uh, how have your kids' hockey seasons been going? Uh, Are you coaching both uh, teams this winter? I'm not coaching my daughter this winter. I'm uh, I'm an on ice helper. I take uh, help out at practices and things. Okay, but uh, I don't really do a ton of coaching for that. She made. uh, she made a team where the coaches were picked before the team was even selected. She ended up making a triple A team this year. Oh, nice. Um, so it, it's been, it's been great. She's had a fun year and, uh, you know, we're Ken down the stretch. Uh, I do coach my son's team. That's, uh, that's been great. Oh man. He's come a long way. The whole team I've coached a lot of these kids for the last probably five years off and on. And what and age group are your kids in again? My daughter's U 13. My son is U 15. Uh, so that would be Pee Wee and Bantam in the old days. Right. And, and uh, yeah, I know like the, the Bantam age kids now have really come a long way as far as they're finally starting to mature. You're and, starting to uh, see a bigger uh, increase in, in skill development over the past year, probably. It's terrific. The way they move, they've been played together for a few years now. So the way they move the puck around and uh, know where each other's at, it's, it's fun. I'm starting to coach them on like, real situations, giving them key fa- different face off alignments for different situations. I can coach them a lot more now. We're working on special teams and things like that. So it's, uh, I'm starting to do a lot more advanced stuff because they're ready to handle it. And it's been, it's been a lot more fun for me because they're recognizing how important it is to work together as a team. It's not just kids trying to skate straight line down the ice anymore and just shoot every time they're, they're playing real hockey and scoring real hockey goals now. So it's uh, yeah, it's been a treat to watch. That's great to hear. And I mean, I didn't play at the AAA level, but I even remember for myself that uh, probably the biggest increase I ever had in ability was going from grade eight to grade nine. So about 14 to 15 years old. And, you know, at that age, you're starting to see some kids either develop faster than others. So there could be a big growth spurt while other kids haven't had it. Are, are you noticing a disparity in your teams where uh, some kids are maturing faster, um, both in their talent and just height wise uh, compared to some of the other kids on the team? There's definitely uh, some kids are left behind. Now there's a significant difference in the maturity level and the development uh, as human beings. Uh, for some of these kids, my goalie has like a full bro- grown beard now and he's only 14 wow. years old. <laughs> so people have come in and like, they want to check his birth certificate and stuff. Like it's, it's quite funny. And, and then you've you got a guy that, like Nugent Hopkins who turns 31 in a couple months and it barely looks like he even shaves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So there's a big discrepancy uh, and it's, it's worked out to my son's advantage. He's one of the taller ones now, and he's pretty big and strong now. So he's he's been able to accomplish a lot more and uh, learn how to use his size to his advantage. So, yeah, you notice the difference. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. And I also wanted to say congrats to you on receiving your second Nova Scotia Coach of the Month Award a few months ago. Uh, you obviously have a passion for the game and for coaching, so it must be a nice feather in your cap to get recognized for your time and commitment. It's... It, that's a special one because that's selected because somebody, I didn't even know I was up for the award. That's one that people nominate you privately, uh, submit your name. So that's, that's a special one because it means that people who you're, you know, you're coaching their kids and the parents are noticing and they're appreciating that enough to contact like, Nova Scotia, and put your name in there as a submission. So that, that one means a lot because you have no idea it's coming. Right. Well, once again, congrats on that. And uh, as a teacher of hockey skills, I'm sure you enjoyed seeing the most skilled players in the world assemble in Toronto over the weekend. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, the All-Star game was cool. But, uh, yeah, you got to see the best players in the world in the league all on the same sheet of ice. But for me, it was the skills competition that I really looked forward to. Uh, Was it the same for you back in the 90s? 
it was definitely uh, a big part of it. I, it was just was the whole weekend. It was like, you know, that's, that's what you're watching. It's not like you're just waiting for one event or, or the game or the skills comp. It's like, this is what we're watching. The skills competition was every bit as exciting to me as anything else. And particularly, like I just said, you're not looking for one event because I did like the whole thing, but there are the key events like the shooting accuracy competition back when we were kids was like, uh, you know, the, the 100 meter relay or sprint in the Olympics where just everyone's looking forward to this one quick event, but it's like so magical. The well, getting to shot, see all I the remember, targets like, shatter was always awesome. It's so fun. <laughs> like it was such a fun event. Yeah. And, uh, of course every name seemed magical then, um, and it was true, like not every team had to be represented. So it was like truly the best and all that. I have a lot of, I don't know, there's, uh, I don't mind how they do it now. I don't, I don't hate it. Like some people do. Uh, I also, you know, one year the Oilers had what eight players there on one team. Yeah. Like I don't and, know and the coach, I, I think it was actually nine in, in the 1986 all-star game and Glenn Sather was the coach and both goalies. That's even the crazier thing. Andy Moog and Graf here were both there. <laughs> right. I mean, that just shows in, in the Oilers heyday, they really were their own all-star team. <laughs> It but was like, oh. and then you fast forward to the mid two thousands, and they didn't have a single one there. I mean, there were some years where Hemsky um, had made it, but he had to opt out due to an injury. And Ryan Smith only ever played in one in two thousand seven. Sean Horikoff got into one in oh eight. But there were years where the Oilers didn't have a representative at the All Star game, and now they've tried to make it so that every team has one. And you know, sometimes it hurts a guy now like Zach Hyman, who deserves to be there on merit. And the Oilers fans did everything they could to vote him in. Unfortunately, they had to send four Leafs players and four Canucks players instead for some reason. But uh, I mean, yeah. we won't gripe about it too much. It is, after all, just the All Star game. But because it was in Hyman's hometown, I really wanted him to be there. Yeah, that was a real disappointment because uh, I mean. I mean, if you're going to have extra players from any team right now, like Zach Hyman is playing incredibly. He's been the most consistent Oiler. He's even the best one on the Oilers most consistently. So it's it's unfortunate that... At least from a goal-scoring perspective, yeah. So Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's... Because uh, my, my thought is that, that Connor and Leon have been to quite a few already. They're going to be at more in the future. This was probably Hyman's one chance to get there because if not at age 31, then when? So, mm. you, you know, he, he, it might never happen for him now. And I think that being able to come back to Toronto and participate in some of those events, I think would have been really cool. So that was a tough one. Uh, I mean, also shout out to his dad. He was retweeting every single Zach Kyman all-star hashtag trying to get him in there too. So uh, just like yourself, another proud hockey parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's great to see them online, you know, and being active in the community like that. Oh yeah, no, he's awesome. Almost every tweet that I have about Zach Hyman, he retweets. So like the, you know, he's a, like I said, a pretty supportive hockey parent. I'm sure uh, if your if your son ends up making the the show someday, you'll be doing the same thing to get him in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I would. Tough call, Pod, leading the charge to to get him into the game. Uh, <laughs> but uh, all right, let's talk about the 2024 NHL All Star Skills now. It was a revamped format featuring 12 NHL All-Stars competing for points in eight events with the player who accumulated the most points taking home the $1 million prize. And to no one's surprise, Connor McDavid dominated the event and was crowned the first ever All-Star skills champion. Josh, even though McDavid isn't running away with the scoring title this season as we've seen him do previously, he showed the rest of the NHL that he's still the best player in the world on Friday night, didn't he? Absolutely. He is. Uh, he does things that no one else can do right now. It's not that he just does them consistently. He does things that no one else can do. Um, he's just a treat to watch. We're so lucky to have that to watch every night. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, he won four out of the six events he competed in to secure the overall title. Uh, and as Oilers fans, like you said, we get to watch him 90 plus times a year, including playoffs. So we're used to seeing him do incredible things on the ice night after night. But for other fan bases around the league, especially the ones out east who don't get to watch him as often, 
I'm glad that they had a chance to see him go head to head against the most talented players in the NHL and win fairly handily. And uh, it's just so incredibly apparent that the game of hockey has never seen a player like Connor McDavid. And to be perfectly honest, it might not see a player like him again for a very, very long time, if ever. It's unreal. I remember watching, to relate this to something else, uh, watching the Pittsburgh Penguins Stanley Cup runs in you know 16 and 17. And I remember um, just watching Sidney Crosby. And you know things, things that he does are so automatic for him. I was like, I know exactly where this puck is going because this is what he does all the time. And then it just dawned on me that no, like it's just him. I expect that from him, but no one else. And it's like, I even wrote an article, like, do we take Sidney Crosby for granted now? Like, is that what's happening? So I've promised myself that I won't do that for <laughs> Connor McDavid. Like when he does something special, I'm recognizing it in the moment and enjoying it for what it is instead of going, oh, of course he did that. It's Connor McDavid. It's, it think, still blows my mind every time I see him do something. Yeah. And I think that just happens with generational talents like Crosby and McDavid. They're on a higher standard than everyone else. I mean, last season when McDavid put up 153 points, uh, it was just multi-point game after multi-point game. You know, he he was running away with the scoring title. Other than Dreisaitl, who finished second, he was 40 points ahead of the next highest scoring player in the league. And that's just remarkable to think about, you know, how far, like he lapped the field, unlike any player we've seen since Gretzky in the early nineties. And And for McDavid, no, and for McDavid to be doing that in this era, I think makes it even more impressive. So when you do see that as often as we have, because this is year nine of him being in Edmonton, uh, maybe take it for granted isn't the right way to say it, but you just become used to it. Like if, if McDavid doesn't get three points against a weaker team. Like if they're playing Anaheim or Chicago or something, you say, oh, it wasn't really a great night for him. But that's just the high standard that we've come to expect, (laughs) that he is going to light it up every night. That game against the Nashville Predators, okay, perfect example. The last two games going into the the break, three-point game against the Blackhawks, four-point game against the uh, Predators, so he's factored in on the Oilers' last seven goals scored, and I don't even think that got mentioned. It's just Connor McDavid doing Connor McDavid things. Yeah, uh, and it's I hate to say stuff like that to all the fans who think that that's all the Oilers are because really, uh, during this you know run they're on and this season uh, they've they've spread it around, which is great, which is all the more. Uh, special when he still finds a way to to come up with those points, you know, when he doesn't necessarily have to anymore or the team isn't always putting him in a situation where, of course, he's going to get the points because he's he's put in those spots. Now he's, you know, he's, I, I don't want to say this, he's obviously more than just a roster player, but he's now just one of, you know, a, t- a solid team that can score from many different facets now. So mm-hmm. the fact that he still, at times, can run away with that team and and be in on seven goals when they don't, when we are getting goals from other places, that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. That makes it more impressive to me that he can go on a run like that. Yeah, and if you look at the the even strength scoring over this sixteen game winning streak, and we'll touch on this a little more in later in the podcast, but. I believe it's McDavid with 17 points, Dreisaitl 16, and then you've got Warren Fogle at 14 and McLeod at 12. So it's not like they're miles ahead of those guys. Uh, You'd expect Dreisaitl and McDavid to be way higher, and they get to play on the power play as well. So uh, for anyone to be in the upper stratosphere of points on the Oilers, you have to be on that first power play unit. But the, the, the fact that guys like Fogle and McLeod are chipping in uh, in the even strength minutes they get because they're not going to get onto that power play. That is a big boost for this team too. It is. It's for sure. And it's becoming harder to pick who my favorite player is on this team (laughs) because it it almost changes every night because they all do something that's like, wow, this is awesome. Now, now I'm really rooting for this guy. They're all just coming out of the woodwork and, and, have picked up their socks and I mean Fogel has been quite consistent all year too he's probably one of the only ones besides Hyman um that's like I would say Fogel may have been maybe my 
most consistent player of anyone on that team, which which says a lot about him. Um, but yeah, I like to see guys like McLeod start to pick it up. I mean, it's not like he it's not like he was scoring a ton before or even a little bit before, you know, <laughs> and all of a sudden he goes on this run. Um, it's, it all started with that game in Winnipeg. And then once he got that empty netter, the floodgates opened. Yeah, it's it's been such a, it's been such a joy. And when he gets into it, that smile he's got, that uh, toothless <laughs> smile, <laughs> I love to smile. See it, right? I just you just can't help but love the guy. Yeah, I mean it's and I'm sure if you asked McDavid, he would say that he loves that the team is playing better even without him on the ice and that more guys are chipping in. I mean, he is such a team first guy even though he is the best player in the world. I, I think back to 3 years ago during the the second pandemic season. Uh, That was the year where he had 105 points in 56 games. Uh, McDavid factored into 58% of the Oilers' goals that year, either with a goal or an assist. Last season, when he had 153 points, he only factored into 47%. So even though that was his best season by a long shot, the team around him was still scoring more. And even this season... Uh, it's even um, a lower percentage of the the goals that he's contributed to. So the fact that the Oilers are continuing to build a better team around him and going down the stretch, we know that this is when McDavid always picks it up a few notches. I think that that's a, a good recipe for this team going forward. It's, it's so disgusting, the numbers you just said. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> that long ago that Jamie Benn won the scoring race with 80-something points. Yeah, the year and before then, McDavid came into the league, 2014-15, he had 87, which is the lowest point total ever in a full 82-game season by a scoring champion. It's, <laughs> I mean, last year, McDavid had 89 assists. You know, <laughs> he, he would have won the scoring title very Gretzky-like on his assists alone. <laughs> It's disgusting. I know. And he beat a player, the second best player. He he beat the second highest player by half of Jamie Ben's points total yeah. for the year he won it. Like that's it's it's ridiculous. And, and and I mean, you know, Leon last year, he tied Kucherov for the second most points in a single season in the salary cap era. And that didn't even get mentioned because McDavid stole all the highlight or uh, headlines, I should say. So I mean it's it truly was a special season. I, I still think that if they would have got by Vegas, they would have won the cup. Uh, I don't think Dallas or Florida would have stopped them. So that's always a little bit frustrating. But um, I really think that this season is as good of a chance for them to get it done. And um, this 16-game winning streak has definitely made up for their disastrous start and got them back in the mix. And now they're only, what, five points back of Vegas with five games in hand. So not not only are the Oilers going to be finishing in a top three spot, it looks like, they have a really good chance to still get home ice advantage in the first round, which I don't think anyone would have predicted even a month ago. (laughs) Not at all. And I still laugh, uh, you know, when the Oilers were down at the bottom and they lost to San yeah. Jose. And how many people at that time were were saying, you know, what what can the San Jose Sharks do to turn this <laughs> around? And, and you know, turned, no one was saying that. And yet somehow with the Oilers, even though it was so dismal, everyone knew that this was possible. Well, you have to remember, they were widely considered a Stanley Cup favorite coming into the season. Like a ton of industry experts had the Oilers picked as their Stanley Cup choice for the year. So it's not just like Oilers fans were being homers and saying, this is our year to win the Cup. It was a consensus throughout the hockey world that the Oilers were a true contender. And I mean, those (laughs) those opinions were starting to look really bad, you know, (laughs) about the mid-November mark. But ever since American Thanksgiving... They have just been on a tear, winning 24 of their last 27 games. Uh, I just, I never imagined a run like this coming. And the fact that the Oilers have done it and it doesn't look like they have any signs of slowing down has just been awesome to see. I do remember saying when they were were down, like, you know, it sucks. It sucks how far down they are. But if they do manage to turn the season around, 
then I remember thinking, like, imagine how much fun the different streaks they'll have to go on will be. I never oh, imagined, yeah. of course, a streak like this, but I just I knew that okay, if they do make the playoffs like they should, then they're gonna have to do something really, really enjoyable that's gonna get make this a fun year that more so than probably if they had just gone, you know, win three here, lose one there, win two here, lose one there. I I, I kind of like this season more, you know? <laughs> it's such yeah, a fun and, ride. And you know, now that they have Oilers plus and that Basically, every day of the Oilers season is documented. They could put together an awesome documentary video that they could sell to fans in the summer if they end up winning the Cup because you could tell a great story from the first day of Captain Skate when they all arrived back in early September through to that tough start to the year, through this amazing winning streak, and if it goes all the way till June and they win the Cup. I mean, this is going to be one of the greatest comeback stories in NHL history. Oh, absolutely. You're right. They could sell that big time. I'd buy that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Put me down for one as well. Uh, okay. Let's go through the six events that McDavid competed in, starting with the fastest skater. And after winning this event three times previously, McDavid opted not to compete in the uh, fastest skater at last year's skills competition, but he entered the race again this year and completed a lap in a time of 13.408 seconds to win the fastest skater and earn five points, positioning him atop the all-star skills leaderboard. Josh, was there ever a doubt in your mind that McDavid wouldn't win this event? I wouldn't say, like, there's no doubt in my mind that he shouldn't win the, like, he should win the event, I mean. Uh, it's just a matter of how much they're really going to push themselves around the turns, I think is what it is. Um, if some guy just decides, you know, I'm really going to bear down and, and put everything into this, it, I could I could see how maybe he'd be a little cautious going Well, they wore the helmets too. for the first time this year, too. Well, that's that's what I, I remember watching that with my kids going like, thank you. Like, how did the... <laughs> How have they gone this many years with no helmets? So I think that, because I the really million bucks was on the line that they were really going to be <laughs> taking it up a notch. And, you know, I, do you remember last year, uh, Kale McCarr actually slipped? And, yeah. I mean, thank goodness they have those big cushions around the uh, the boards to catch them because he would have went headfirst into the boards taking that really sharp turn, which would have been a, a disastrous outcome. So thank goodness that they did put their helmets on. And I'm sure... Uh, the owners of these teams, you know, don't want some of their best players who are competing in this skills competition to get hurt here. So uh, I think a smart decision to finally make that step. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, you know, that just, I can relax a little and watch it when they're going around the turns. And uh, there, so really, there's no doubt in my mind that McDavid should have should have won the event. Like, it's just, like I said, a matter of, of whether they were really going to give it their all. And, and it looked like they did, and it was a fun event to watch. Yeah, and he even joked um, in his interview after that he didn't even win the Oilers' fastest skater last time he competed in it. So he said, I don't know how I'm going to do in this one. But uh, <laughs> but obviously we know that you know he's going to give it everything he has, and on his best day, no one can touch him. And, and really, all of McDavid's skills are elite, but his speed is his single greatest weapon. He has that supernatural first step and the ability to turn on a dime without slowing down, which gives him a big advantage in an event like this because it's not a straight line race. And with the victory, McDavid became the first player to ever win the fastest skater four times. He's also the only player to ever win the event three consecutive times, which he did from 2017 to 2019. And then after sitting out the one-timers, McDavid posted a time of 25.755 seconds to win the inaugural stick handling challenge. And with his second event victory of the night, McDavid climbed into a tie for second with Elias Pettersson at 10 points, one point back of Kale McCarr and Matthew Barzell for the overall lead. Uh, Josh, while it was awesome to see McDavid win the fastest skater again, did he, like, do you think his run in the stick handling challenge was even more impressive? I was quite impressed with that event overall. It was one of my favorite events. Um, and be it was a lot to do with it just, like you said, McDavid's speed is is his biggest tool, but it's right. also that he can bring the puck with him at that speed and it doesn't seem to affect him at all. And that was really showcased in this uh, this particular 
particular event, the way he makes the turns, he, he knocked over in, in a couple of events, he knocked over some of the cones cause he was t- taking the puck so tightly around the turns and just how smoothly and quickly he was able to stick handle around the, those, those wider, you know, the wider barriers and stuff. It just, it really, it's, it's hard to impress upon people that see it regularly, how difficult that is to do that many times in a row at that pace. Um, that was to me the most impressive, uh, the impressive thing to watch is, is those guys take those big wide stick handles around those barriers and be able to keep the puck so tight and bring it side to side so quickly and move up the ice. Uh, I really, really loved that event and it, and it showcased why McDavid stands apart and how he's able to create separation in games against top NHL talent all the time. Oh, for sure. I mean, he can make the best defenders in the world look ordinary uh, just because of his incredible talent with the puck on a stick. And, you know, although McDavid is the fastest skater in hockey history, there are a few players in the league who can probably go stride for stride with him over a short distance. But when it comes to controlling the puck in full flight, there's no one close to him. And in this event, he showed his deft hands as he dangled through those 20 green pucks with ease while several other players bobbled the puck at least once. And uh, after getting off to that great start, I was pretty sure he was going to take this event too because for the rest of the stations, they had to move their feet a lot more. And um, he ended up finishing over a full second faster than Barzell, who was the runner-up. So I agree uh, it was more impressive than the fastest skater just because, like you kind of said, he has to use more tools than just how quickly can I do a, a lap around the ice. Exactly, yeah. And did you see anything from maybe one of these skills competitions? Not necessarily that you want to replicate in practice for uh, your kids' teams, but just uh, some skills that they could pick out and say, you know, these are types of things you can work on on your own or in a practice to try and uh, develop a little more and, and work on things that will actually be used in a game situation. Every good coach has a notepad with them all the time, even <laughs> old school. And you just, you're at a rink and there's a team practicing before you and you see a drill, you're like, oh, I'll jot that down and steal that. Thank you very much. And, yeah. and you apply it. Uh, the one thing from the skills competition, uh, it's over the last year or so, and especially this year, saucer passes have become a fascination with my players. Okay. And to just watch how easily they, they just do those quick, flicks over the the blue barriers they had and into those little mini nets that they were doing as part of the as part of one of the drills um that just that was kind of mesmerizing to watch at how how easily and smoothly you know they're worried about just hitting the mini net whereas you know players my son's age or whatever would be worried about trying to get it over that blue pad first before they right. even think about where the puck's going to go afterwards right like just just something like that is you have no idea how many times well you you might people that don't play hockey probably have no idea how frequently a little raise of the puck puts it over you wonder how these passes get through and you're like that was impossible and how did the defender not stop that and it's, and it's because players can put the puck any height they want. Um, so sometimes, even if you think a saucer pass is coming, right. uh, uh, the guys I play against, they can only do it like one height, whatever. It's either a saucer pass or on the ground. You just have to pick between two sort of planes. Whereas these guys, they'll watch the defender stick. And if they see the defender stick go up, they'll just sort of bloop it slowly or bloop it higher or whatever. Like you have to not only try and put your stick in a lane horizontally but you also have to worry about all the different lanes that could be in vertically so that's how these guys get that puck through and to to see how easily that many players can do it consistently over those blue barriers watching that drill it's actually quite impressive yeah definitely and i think one of the reason why the saucer pass has become so popular is probably because the goaltenders are so good now that if you're not going to beat them clean uh, you really have to get them moving laterally. I mean, we see it on two-on-ones down the ice on the rush. We also see it on the power play, especially, you know, like for the Oilers with McDavid trying to set up dry sidle in his spot. If you can get the goalies moving laterally for that one-time option, that is going to give you a way better chance to score. And uh, with defenders taking away the 
the clean pass on the ice, like I said, you're forced to either try to saucer it over them or take the shot. So I think that is going to become even more prevalent going forward. Where we're going to see players trying to master that skill where they can get that puck across. Because like I said, uh, if if the defensemen are just going to basically lay flat or, or get their long stick out and take the, the passing option away, if you don't think that you have the best angle to shoot at, your saucer pass is probably the best chance that you're going to have to create a scoring chance in that situation. For sure. And uh, I'll use that as an example of proof as to why the the example of Nugent Hopkins being some power play merchant, it yeah. always goes to him first on that side. He Because he's, he's so sure-handed. Holds- and he's he's unreal at timing these passes and locating them and uh, getting them through the sticks and things like that. He's just an incredible talent to watch passing wise. Yeah, and, and you know sometimes he does pick up the secondary assist. It's not always him that's the the primary playmaker on a play, but there are very few players that I would rather have on my power play just because you know when he gets the puck, he's going to make a smart calculated risk play with it and then it won't be uh throwing the puck into a bad spot he's either going to curl back and wait for someone to open up or he's just going to give it back to bouchard at the point or mcdavid circling back into the slot so he's a guy that i'll always trust out there on that power play absolutely Uh, all right um so after winning the first two events of the night, McDavid finished outside of the top five in the passing challenge and picked up no points in the standings. And he actually got off to a good start, but his passes were just a bit off the mark the rest of the way. Uh, Josh, were you surprised that McDavid didn't place higher in this one? Or does that just go to show how tough the passing event was, even for the guy with the most assists since he entered the league in 2015-16? To me, when you're passing and you're trying to hit someone's stick, it's amazing how how different it is to pass in a game situation under pressure, and you're just going on instinct, and you're not staring at a specific target. You're just putting the puck into an area of space for somebody to, to get. Um, so it's actually these to, to skate along at not full speed necessarily and try and hit a, a stationary target, is it's actually more annoying than if you're moving and your your target is moving and you know you can kind of work on the timing and just kind of recognize where they're going to be and where to put the puck it's uh, to me it just speaks to how good these are these guys are in tight and under game pressure they just they just cruise and they make these passes so automatic whereas when you're not you're not under it's almost like if you get a breakaway and how easy it is because you just don't have time to think versus when you get a penalty shot, you know, and there's no one chasing you and you have all the time in the world, it just becomes sort of mentally different. Um, So it's not necessarily surprising to me that it was difficult to hit these targets because it's just not something that that matches a game game situation that you're always in. Yeah. And and I mean, I thought McDavid had a good shot to win this one, but you're basically playing against the clock and once you've missed a few times already, then you probably start rushing some passes and it snowballs from there because like you're thinking, okay, I got to catch up. I got to catch up. Um, however, McDavid bounced back in the next event as he went four for four in 9.158 seconds to win the accuracy shooting. He also posted the second fastest perfect score in all-star skills history and his third event win of the night vaulted him back into first place with 15 points. Josh, Even after scoring 64 goals last season and winning the Rocket Richard Trophy, do you think McDavid is still underrated as a sniper? I really think he is. Um, And how many goals do we see where he just kind of is going towards the net and he doesn't even really shoot it? He just sort of passes it into an area towards the goalie's feet and and then it goes in and you're like... Oh, there's been a ton of goals he scored last year uh, that were right along the ice, but... He, it's like you said, he, uh, and sorry to cut you off, but he does that like quick little move at the last second, and as he dekes to the outside, uh, the puck just comes off his blade so quickly that they don't have time to get down into a butterfly position, and it just goes right through their feet. <laughs> exactly. When when I play uh, many sticks with my kids, you know, you're in the little nets and you're on your knees and you have a little two foot stick, and the the kids take up almost the whole net. If you just tried to shoot normally, <laughs> then it's really hard to score so what i'll do is i'll just float these bloopers up and it's sort of it's hard to read the bounce (laughs) and sometimes like these off-speed pitches kind of deal it's just harder and 
So that's what these past shots are. Is like you just don't expect it. You don't know when they're coming because he doesn't change the way he stick handles. You never know when he's going to pass or shoot, and he doesn't take a big wind up or anything. It's just like you said. You're just trying to adjust to where he is. So as you move, all of a sudden the puck is in the <laughs> hole that you just created, and you don't even notice that the puck left his stick yet. Um, those are the kinds of goals that, like you. That is a sniper type of goal. That's not just luck. It's pre-planned, and the timing has to be just spot on for that. To find those holes all the time without overpowering a goalie, without having the pass come across, like you said, and forcing them to move laterally, to just go down at pace and score because you surprised the goalie with your, your shot placement, your shot location, and your shot timing, that's a true snipe. Like, that is putting a puck in the only space that you have for it to go in. And there's not a thing anyone can do about it. And to be able to do that every single time is, is very, very impressive. Oh, absolutely. And I just wanted to say quickly, I love that you made a mini sticks reference too. And <laughs> I think it's awesome that you, you get down and play with your kids because like, I mean, I played mini sticks a ton growing up. I don't remember ever playing once with my dad because he worked construction and had bad knees. So, uh, I don't, I don't ever remember him down on the carpet with me playing, uh, mini sticks, but, uh, that is, that is funny. Uh, I'm sure your kids are well past the age of you, uh, letting them win though. Oh, absolutely. There, it's on, man. There's no, they're not going to learn that way. Exactly. You pound it into them. That's what I say. That's awesome, man. But yeah, I mean, a, a great, a great point too about you know how McDavid is able to score his goals. And I mean, if you just go on YouTube and watch his highlights from last season, all sixty-four goals. You know, there are other players that have had a sixty-goal season in the past, but. I don't know how many more spectacular highlight reels you're going to find of 60 goals. I mean, it was just night after night impressive ones. I mean, the way he's able to even go below the goal line and bank it off the goalie's name bar and in and different kind of shots like that. It's just phenomenal the things he can do and just the goals off the rush. It's uh, when his career is eventually over, uh, the career highlight reel that they show at the Hockey Hall of Fame, I don't even know how they're going to cut it down. It's going to be like an hour and a half long. I I just think about I just for whatever reason this just popped in my head now of Patrick Kane's Stanley Cup winning goal and how he shot it yeah. and then it was like he's celebrating and then he's like trying to convince people no it was in right and everyone's like what wait what went in that's a lot of McDavid's goals he like he's just in a spot where it's like okay he's run out of options now what's he gonna do and somehow, like you said, from behind the net or on the goal line, he'll still score. And then he just kind of cruises along and waits for everyone to realize, yeah, the puck's in. Yeah. And, <laughs> and if you, like, if oh, you think right. about it, when he came into the league, he had all these incredible tools, but maybe the one skill that he didn't have was an elite shot. And he really didn't need one because his whole life, he had better hands and was faster than everyone. So he could just basically create scoring chances at will. He didn't need to have a shot that could beat goalies from distance. And it's something he really worked on. And he became one of the premier shooters in the league last year. Now we've seen him sort of go back a little more to his first instinct um, as a passer now. And I, I mean, I think that he's always going to be a pass first guy, but McDavid is still one of the best goal scorers in the league. He has a lightning quick release and he can pick corners even in full stride, which makes him dangerous as a setup man or a finisher off the rush. And, you know, I tweeted about this last night, but I actually think his most impressive feat in his all-star career is that he's 12 for 12 in accuracy shooting. He went four for four in both the preliminary round and the final at last year's skills competition and followed that up with another perfect score this year. He's the only player in NHL history to ever do that. And I just wanted to highlight that achievement. I think it's remarkable that he's never missed a target. It's, it's incredible. When you tweeted that out, I was like blown away. It's like, this can't be real. Like, uh, sure. and you think of all the great shooters, um, you know, it was always exciting when someone went four for four as a kid. We talk about the ones as a kid, um, but to do it three times, <laughs> I mean, and, and to never miss, like that's just incredible. Would you say that Leon Dreisaitl is regarded regarded as a, a a better goal scorer than McDavid? 
I would say that he's he's more known for it. Yeah, I mean, he's had three fifty goal seasons. He was the runner up to the Rocket once. Like, I mean, he's considered one of the best goal scorers in the league. Well, you look at Connor struggling in the passing event, as we talked about earlier. Leon in back to back years has had real trouble in that accuracy shooting. I mean, he missed several times, and you know, here's a guy who can pick corners with the best of them and has you know this un. This incredible ability to score from angles that don't even seem possible, and yet you put him in the center of the ice. He's used to scoring from below the goal line. You put him right in the middle of the ice and give him four targets, and he had trouble hitting them. So it just shows you. I think when you get into those pressure-packed events, and you know, like I said, you, uh, you start to miss a few, and then you start just trying anything. Uh, it, it's not as easy as it looks. So the fact that McDavid has gone twelve for twelve, I think, is just incredible. Yeah, you bring up a good point about other play. Like other players should be able to go for for four. There, there are NHL talents. They all can snipe. Austin um, Matthews did as well, but he did it about a second slower. Yeah, than Connor finished with. <laughs> yeah, uh, it might have not but, even been a second. I think Matthews was nine point three seconds or something, and McDavid was nine point one. So it was closer than than a, a full second, but um, still, Connor got there quicker. Yeah, and he and he's done it like you said eight other times. Like to I, yeah. I mentioned before, how it's not really simulating a game situation. It's it's almost like it's more pressure. It's more difficult because you have too much time. Uh, uh, it's it's just too set up for success that event. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. So, so somehow it it just makes it harder to do it properly and. Like McDavid just showed that he, it doesn't matter to him. He's just that elite, that automatic. And speaking of scoring, in the next event, McDavid faced Colorado Avalanche goalie Alexander Gorgiev in the one on one breakaways. And while he was able to get a few pucks past him, Gorgiev had his number on that night, Josh. Yeah, it just seems like McDavid uh, could. Usually he just comes through these holes that you don't know how he got there in a game, and he's coming at such pace. Like it just, it just seemed like he didn't wasn't able to create that element of surprise. Um, I, I don't know what it was, but yeah, he, Gorgiev did did a really nice job of tracking him and following him. Um, it's it's just one of those one of those things where he where he was able to just focus on the shooter and when a goalie can focus on a shooter like that it doesn't really matter necessarily who it is uh especially those closer pucks that's quite hard the ones yeah. that at the blue line are a little easier but the ones close where you just turn and all of a sudden you're right on top of the goalie and you don't really have a chance to make those cuts and stuff uh it, it does present a bit of a challenge i don't know how many i don't know if any players really had a lot of success in those in close pucks yeah, and I mean, the NHL has tinkered with the breakaway contest over the years, but I think they got it close to right this year. I mean, it's constant action, like you said. And I, I like that the pucks at the blue line were worth two points because you had to skate back further to grab them. But you could tell the players were gassed by the end of just doing breakaway after breakaway after breakaway. And I, and I thought McDavid would have tallied a few more times in this event, but credit to Gorgiev, who had the poke check going and knocked the puck off his stick a couple times. And uh, you know, after failing to earn any points in the breakaway challenge, McDavid trailed McCarr by seven points and needed either a first or second place finish in the final event to take home the title. And of course, he posted a time of 40.066 seconds to win the obstacle course and was crowned the first ever NHL All-Star Skills champion with 25 points overall. Uh, Josh, McDavid said that this was his favorite event of the night because it incorporated all of the different skills that players use in an NHL game. Uh, what were your thoughts on the obstacle course overall? And uh, did you think McDavid had a chance to win after a bit of a shaky start there? I really liked that event. I really liked overall. I found in general that this was a very enjoyable skills competition to watch because it was just... It, it was there was nothing elaborate or overdone or any of these crazy pre-recorded ones and you're in the stands and all that it was it was just show me the skills and that's what this was and i agree with mcdavid that this is kind of the marquee event because it does encompass a little of everything um yeah he had a bit of a slow start but it's it's just, emulative of their season isn't it <laughs> a bit of a rocky start and then and Pretty then you strong. just explode 
it's it's well let's it's, hope that this season finishes the same way that <laughs> he finished <laughs> off the skills competition absolutely there's an even better prize than the million bucks too <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and after you look back at that event, like he did lose control of the puck, uh, deking through the first part of the obstacle course. And, you know, I thought he might be in trouble there, but thankfully he made up time passing the pucks into those mini nets and he was off to the races from there and finished, uh, nearly three seconds faster than McCarr to win the million dollars. So it was a dominant showing. And I thought it was great to hear him say after that, he's planning to donate some of the money to charity and share some with his teammates as well. And I really wouldn't expect anything else from McDavid, uh, aside from being the best player in the world, he has tremendous character and I didn't think there was any way he was going to keep all the money for himself. No, I did make a joke tweet that he should have honored McCarr's uh, promise and given all the Colorado Avalanche D a hundred thousand each out of the money. But, uh, <laughs> but it's nice to see, yeah, him do something with it. Uh, yeah, uh, he he owes the Avs a different kind of payback in the playoffs this year. <laughs> he sure does, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and I mean, great uh, event overall. I, look. In recent years, when they've gone to Florida or Vegas or different places, they've tried to do uh, a lot of gimmicky things that kind of tie into the local city, you know, stuff with surfboards and dunk tanks. And um, I, I don't know, I just, like you said, I like that they went back to basics. And McDavid was actually one of the people who was consulted on this. They, the NHL talked to several players about how to make this event mean something again, how to improve it. And I know he took a little bit of flack from a couple fans who said, oh, McDavid made the rules for the event and then won it. You know, it was a heist from the NHL. But, you know, he wasn't the only one who was involved in helping organize this thing. And uh, it was just a few conversations, too. But for then him to come out after telling them how his thoughts on how they can make it better and win it, I mean, it's not like it was automatic that just because he had a hand in this that he was going to take home the the grand prize at the end. He still had to go out there and beat the best players in the world. Absolutely. Uh, there was one event in particular. I got to give credit where credit's due here, uh, where William Nylander in the original stick handling competition, um, in the middle part, he kind of bobbled the puck at the start and then yep. he had a shaky end. Um, because he was under time pressure at that point, like you said, but through that middle, he was actually the smoothest one. Like it was very fun. And he was the last to go in the stick handling challenge. And uh, I mean, you you look at McDavid, like his run through those lit up green pucks was flawless. He didn't miss a single step and it was so smooth all the way through. And that's when I said, he's going to win this because you have to skate a lot more. Your feet are more stationary during that part. And as soon as he made it through the first segment without a single bobble, I said, well, okay, well now he's skating with the puck. So it's probably going to be very tough for anyone to catch him at this point. And credit to Nylander, you know, he did make up some time through the middle of the ice, as you talked about, but uh, maybe he would have given McDavid a little more of a push if he would have had a, a better start to that. Yeah, it, I think it think it has to do with the fact that McDavid just set the bar so high that players tried to force it. There was one player, I can't remember who now, I wish I could, I don't know why I don't remember, but actually had quite a good time in one of the obstacle courses, but then he couldn't shoot it through the hole in that cardboard cut. That was also Nylander. So, so, okay, yeah. He missed so, the net twice. Well, I, <laughs> I think that, I think, you know, if he'd have got that in, he would have had a quite good time, but but there, there was so much pressure to get it under that time that I think he forced that shot where it couldn't have been. Well, or whatever, I mean, you, you know look at I mean? McDavid. When he shot the puck through the, the hole in the middle of the net, he was probably, I would say, 10 feet out. Whereas Nylander, knowing that he had to make up time, took his shot from just inside the blue line. So it was a long distance wrister. And then, of right. course, it, it goes wide. He picks up the rebound and I think hits the, the tarp part you know, surrounding the corner of the net before he finally tucks it in. So, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'll give him a shout out for, you know, the effort. I mean, he knew that the only way he was going to have a chance to win that is if he did shoot it from distance because he had to make up that that lost time. But, uh, yeah, a little bit of a tough break uh, sending the puck wide. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's just, that's just, shows you that in every event, in every type of skill, McDavid did something 
yeah. that, you know, put a little bit more pressure or people had to do something just a little greater than they normally would have to, to beat him. It's not like he won it, like he was miles ahead of everything. It's just that he's just that little bit ahead in everything that you, he just does everything just a little bit better. And, you know, a 10th of a second here, five tenths of a second there it makes a big difference when you're trying to win a timed event, you know? Uh, yeah. So he he set himself apart, uh, but it was overall easily the most. I remember saying like not even just in the recent years the most enjoyable skills competition. It literally did bring me back to my childhood and go, okay, this is an event I can get behind now. This reminds me of being a kid and being excited about the skills competition again. I would make my kids sit here and watch this. Whereas if if my kid lost interest because some guy can't shoot a puck into some strange net from like the, the 15th throw of the second deck of a rink. Like that's just not something or, no. or to get dunked in a tank. Like you said, like that's just not something I'm going to make my kids sit through. But, no. And, and really the all-star game has lost a lot of luster over the years. I don't even think that they need it. The marquee event of the all-star weekend is the skills competition. And I think that they have a good format. They should do this going forward. Uh, however, it's going to be at least three years before we see it again, because for the next two <laughs> years, there's going to be international hockey obligations that will nullify a, an, an all-star game. But I'm also hoping in 2027, when it returns, that they sort of just go back to this. And who knows, maybe it'll even be in Edmonton, because apparently the NHL did promise Edmonton an all-star game once they got Ice Tri District completed, and it is in the finishing stage stages now so they should be able to host an all-star game uh, in the near future which uh, they haven't done since 1989 so it'd be great to see uh, Edmonton get this event back where you know <laughs> maybe that would be maybe the only time that we're going to see four or five Oilers there again as if they are the host city <laughs> yeah that'd be awesome and you know that Hyman will see. still be under contract by then so I take back what I said earlier he <laughs> might still get into that all-star game <laughs> there's hope yet just have to wait until maybe 34 or 35, but he'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're not going to break down the NHL All-Star game itself, but McDavid did pick up a goal and two assists in the three-on-three -three tournament and led his team to a come-from-behind win in the semifinal before falling to Team Matthews in, in the final. So all in all, McDavid stole the show in his hometown this weekend. And uh, prior to the All-Star game was the PWHL's three-on-three -three showcase on Thursday night where Team King picked up a 5-3 win over Team Kloss. Uh, Josh, I know you follow the women's game closely and you tweet about the PWHL often. Uh, how much did you enjoy this showcase game and how important was it for the NHL to have it a part of All-Star Weekend? I love that it's part of All-Star Weekend. And I know there's people out there that question, why would the women be part of this event? And, uh, you know, why the men won't be going to their event and all that. But it's it's just a platform. It's a great platform. If you're a fan of hockey, then why isn't it exciting to see more hockey? Uh, to see the best women who finally get to compete against each other in a regular league that's finally all the best women and they have their own little three on three. And, and it's just, we all love three on three hockey. Everyone says they love the three on three overtime. They'd like to see it go longer. And, right. and you know, if you're going to see best on best, you might as well see the best women on the best women too. I just absolutely love the PWHL. I, I love that it exists. I love the, the players, I got to know them in their international levels. And I used to watch the, the Dream Gap Tour with uh, with all the Olympic players that, that uh, you know, weren't playing in the other league that existed at the time, uh, the PHF. Uh, you know, finally, it's a true league where all the best women's players are playing. And to be able to see the best of the best play each other in a three-on-three, -three, it's it's who doesn't want to see that? I don't understand the negativity with why the women are at the event. I think it's so important to grow the game in every aspect. And the game means the game of hockey, not just NHL hockey. Yeah. Uh, if we can have a viable professional women's league and have more options for female players and more options for hockey, for hockey fans to consume, then that's a win-win to me. And, you know, when we were growing up as kids and skating on the outdoor rink, you know, we could either say, you know, you're, you're pretending you're Wayne Gretzky or you're pretending you're Mario Lemieux and it's game seven of the Stanley Cup final and 
uh, you know, you, you score the winning goal in game seven in overtime and, uh, just having those dreams of, of players that, you know, were our heroes that you wanted to, to be like, and, and dreamt of playing in the NHL and winning a Stanley cup, you know, for the young girls who play hockey in this country, you know, they can dream of playing in the Olympics, but they didn't really have a league that they could, you know, say, you know, I want to make it there one day because the NHL wasn't an option for them. So now having their league, I'm guessing as the father of a daughter it, who's also a female hockey player, it's got to be cool for her and her friends to have, you know, some heroes that they can look up to, too. Not that they don't have NHL heroes as well, but some women that they can aspire to say, you know, that's who I want to be like. You know, I'm a fan of her. You know, I want to play like her. I want to be in that league someday, too. Yeah, it's when I look back at what my sister went through, she's five years older than me. Uh, she played university hockey before it was even varsity. Uh, they were using the boys' practice jerseys as their game jerseys and putting themselves in tournaments and stuff. And by the time she graduated, it was in 98, I think, was the very first ever uh, Winter Olympics with championship and stuff. So, yeah, exactly. So, the and for boys growing up, just in case people don't know, they used to have a program where you would either were part of the men's national program and played international. This was before the professionals went, right? You, it was amateur athletes. So you, you'd either be, decide to be part of the Canadian men's national program and play for the Olympics and the international events, or you would go on the NHL path and become a professional player and all that. And that's kind of where the women were like, where if they wanted to play high level hockey, they had to go in the hockey Canada international program because that was the only thing available to them at the time. Whereas now they, they are back to where men's hockey was, uh, you know, in the mid nineties where or early, the, the mid eighties to early nineties, where you're kind of put on a track where you can, you can play on the Olympic team and you can play professional hockey now. It's so it's, it's just another stage of growth where the women's game is kind of mirroring where the men's game was and, and we're just getting that much closer to being on an even par. It's uh, it's so fantastic for these options uh, to have these options for these female players. The women's college hockey is uh, at an incredibly elite level. Now um, you watch some of the top women's college teams uh, and the games are readily available. That's the big thing. So now, like you said, for my daughter, I can just come home. We just were in a tournament in Moncton. And we just went back to the hotel and I could just fire on a, a professional women's hockey game on Sportsnet without even really looking for it. You know, it's just there now. That is mind blowing to me that I could just do that. Like it just, it just couldn't believe it. And then a couple of her teammates pop in and we're, you know, it's just on. You know, we're just watching a professional women's hockey game like like any other game on TV. That's the reality they're going to grow up with. And that's that's I couldn't ask for anything more for that. And we're just a couple months into year one of this league. So you just think how it can grow uh, next season and in the, the next five years. I mean, uh, especially, like I said, with Olympic participation uh, coming back, not just for the the men, but you know, women getting to go out there too, probably a lot from these leagues. It's just the 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 growth of women's hockey is just going to get bigger and bigger in the years to come. Yeah, it it is. And what I really like about this league is before when you wanted to watch the best women on the best women, you could, you know, internationally, but they were assigned to the team of their country. And now we're starting to see these players uh, mixed more. Uh, So you're playing against players that you've played with forever. Canadian and and, uh, American women on the same team. Yeah. Yeah. There's these strange rivalries developing that you just, it's, and you know, there's also the aspect of a lot of these players in women's hockey. It's unique because some of the players date each other or married to each other. So, you know, there's that aspect too. It's uh, it's, (laughs) <laughs> there's just so much to like about the league. I know they're not going to get everything right, right off the bat, but neither did the NHL. Forever. But what league is going to, and like you said, it's, they haven't even played one full season yet. I'm sure there will be meetings in the summer about how we can make things better next season. What areas didn't work that we can improve on. Um, uh, they've even brought in some different rules than the NHL has, like where uh, if you score a shorthanded goal, the power play is over. Uh, you probably can think of a, a couple other ones too, but that's just one that really caught my attention when I heard it. Yeah, the old jailbreak goal now they're calling it. It's, uh, it is. It's It's quite exciting. And it only took like a few games for one to be scored on. And it's like, oh, that's you're watching it. And it's like, 
Oh, this is how it works. And it's kind of cool. Like they uh, have a three point win system too, right? Yes, they do. It's uh, which again, you know, with a 16 league, that's even more important. You're playing the same teams over and over again. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more of those, what you'd call, you know, six point games or whatever, (laughs) as opposed to, uh, where you play what you might play a team twice and and play like 28 other teams you know three times or whatever the in this it's just six teams so you're constantly those games at hand are always against each other so one win means a big deal uh, it's it's been a lot of fun a lot of fun to watch i'm really enjoying i'm really enjoying this league and this setup i even don't mind some people are complaining that they don't have team names or whatever i kind of like that they're just the cities right now i don't think there's any need to rush that i think they'll have it next season but you know because they didn't probably want to have to wait another year uh they wanted to get things started in december that there was sort of a, a little bit of a a hurry up to this and you know we'll we'll deal with the the team nicknames in the in the summer let's just get the league going first exactly and and i don't think that's made a lick of difference uh i like the uniforms i like the logo i like the i like the style of play i like the venues they're playing in now and finally we have good camera angles and replays instead of doorbell cams online and no replays and you can't really understand what's happening it's uh, women's hockey i don't know I know I've suffered through the the bad years as well, and other people are just finding it now, um, which is great. I love that. Don't get me wrong, like, but just you have to realize how exciting this is for people who have had to go out of their way and watch uh, random Twitch streams that aren't even advertised to watch professional hockey. You've had to go online to these obscure, you know, links that barely are have any camera angles or view or whatever in this tiny little box on the screen and watch games like this is just so significant how far they've come and and the 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 access the accessibility of women's hockey is is just miles above where it used to be and that's there's nothing but positives i have to say about that And the other big news to come out of All-Star Weekend is that NHL players will be returning to the 2026 and 2030 Winter Olympics. Additionally, the NHL and NHLPA will be holding the 2025 NHL Four Nations face-off next February, including Canada, the United States, Sweden, and Finland. Uh, Josh, let's start with the Olympic announcement. How excited are for you to have NHL players back at the Olympics for the first time since 2014? And how important is it for hockey to consistently have a true best-on-best international tournament going forward? I agree that it is really great to have uh, a true best-on-best tournament going forward. What format that comes in? Uh, I don't know, because uh, <laughs> uh, talking about the Olympics specifically, I, I mean, it's great. I love to see the best players go at it uh, on an Olympic stage, the different countries. It's it's fun to see the players wear the different uniforms to be teamed up with different players. And, and I, I really do love a best-on-best tournament. Am I necessarily that excited or, or even that disappointed when they don't go, to be honest? It, to me, it's... The Olympics doesn't have to be necessarily that venue. Uh, I take a lot of pride in Canada and Canadian hockey. And, you know, it's always great to have true representation at the Olympics. I love the Olympics as an event as a whole. But I also don't mind when we when we send other players. Um, I liked it as a kid. Like I said uh, earlier, it was always, uh, you know, the men's national program training ground. And I got to train with some of those players uh, as a as a U13 and U15 athlete, they would come to our practices some for extra ice time and different development, different coaching and things, some of these older players, and they really looked up to them. And, you know, it's not like we were garbage. We won uh, Fabian Joseph, Nova Scotia, proud, uh, captained us to two silvers, you know, in, in, in the 90s. Um, Canadians have always had a, a great program, and it was nice to see uh, certain players uh, – you know, have a chance on that stage. Um, so I do, I, you know, you always hear the NHL players say it's just such an honor to represent your company and we, or your country. And we, we love to have that opportunity to play best on best and compete at the Olympics. And it's, you know, it's crappy when they take that away from us. But I've said before that that's, 
that's a dream for a lot of people too. And, you know, a lot of these NHL players, there's so many different ways that they can represent their team internationally. Um, there's always an under 16 tournament an under 17 tournament an under 18 tournament as they're growing up. Do you see where I'm going with this? Pick an age and under something age, there's a tournament for it. So these guys, these guys have uh, the, the top elite players have ample opportunity to represent their country consistently. And, while I understand that it's a dream for them to go to the Olympics all the time. And, and that, like I said, it's, that would be a dream for any player that got to go. Um, so it's just a matter of whether we want to see best on best hockey all the time. And, and so I'm not, I'm glad they're going to the Olympics to do it. Uh, that's not necessarily the only, if it happened via another vehicle, I'd be just as happy with that too. As long as they get to see best on best competition somehow, some way, um, so it's, it's, like I said, it's great that they're going to the Olympics and I will watch the tournament and look very much forward to it. Uh, I just wouldn't be all that disappointed if the NHL didn't go some years cause I'd still watch the hockey and still enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. And we have to remember that prior to 1998, professional athletes weren't allowed to compete in the Olympics. So, uh, the only best on best tournament that there was, was the Canada cup. Uh, because and that's a big reason why Russia, uh, who was formerly the Soviet Union, dominated that event for decades. Because the best players from North America were all in the NHL, and uh, you know they would win gold year after year. And uh, I mean, Canada had a 50-year drought at the at the Olympics without gold between 1952 and 2002 um, until uh, the golden goal or sorry, um, the, the, the golden loony under the, the ice in 02 in Salt Lake city, where, uh, Mario Lemieux and team Canada finally ended that drought. But you have to remember, uh, it's like you said, a- any vehicle, whatever form it is. Well, there's, there's only two real ways you can do it. You can have now either the winter Olympics or the world cup of hockey and uh, the Canada cup, which predated the world cup of hockey. Uh, I mean, that was something decades ago that, hockey fans in Canada really looked forward to um, the world cup of hockey while still technically best on best doesn't have as much, I think meaning to a younger generation because all they know uh, is NHL players at the Olympics. Um, there's multiple generations now that grew up with that from 98, 02, 06, 2010, 2014. So, uh, having the World Cup of Hockey also a big gap between 04 and 2016 when they had their next one, it it doesn't hold the same meaning to them. So you come from a generation where you can actually, like you said, have memories of uh, not just a, a Canada Cup, but also uh, amateur players going to represent their country at the Olympics. But I think for a lot of you know younger fans who that that's all that they knew. It doesn't uh, it doesn't resonate with them the same way. So uh, to go now all this time without one, I mean, I don't even know if you want to call the 2016 World Cup of Hockey a best on best because they did the Team North America under 23 team. So yeah. so really, 2014 was the last time that we've had. Uh, I guess you could say a true best on best international tournament, and I think that's bad for the growth of hockey because. You, like you said, they have to find some vehicle, some platform to do it. Uh, and the fact that it's been this long, like you look at the World Cup in soccer, like that is, I mean, arguably the biggest sporting event in the world. I mean, probably even bigger than the Super Bowl. But uh, even in other sports, like uh, the World Baseball Classic, you see what that did for baseball. The fact that hockey right now, I don't think this, hockey has never been more skilled than it is at this moment. Uh, there's just talent across the board on every NHL team. And the fact that we've gone, it'll be over a decade, you know, before the next best on best tournament. I think that's a real shame. And, um, for me being a huge Connor McDavid fan, I I'm so disappointed that he didn't get to go in 2018 and 2022. Now there was nothing they could have done in 2022. That was the result of the pandemic, but because of the insurance issues and the, the ongoing battle between the IOC and the NHL, I think that's always going to frustrate me that McDavid was robbed of at least one, but probably two chances to represent Canada at the Olympics because, you know, Crosby had that opportunity. Taves had that opportunity. All these other, you know, players from a generation before him 
And the fact that McDavid will be 29 the first time that he gets to compete in the Olympics, I, I think, you know, even if he wins multiple Stanley Cups in Edmonton, that is something that I'm always going to be frustrated about, that he didn't get those opportunities earlier in his career. That is a that is a real shame, and you are absolutely right about the NHL right now. the The level of talent across the board is just it's just sickening. It's it's so fun to watch. There's I'm interested in a lot more teams now than I ever was. There's still some matchups where I don't necessarily go out of my way to watch, but for the most part, you know, you have your favorite team, but I also have some favorite players around the league, and it would be so fun. To see, like you actually bringing up the Canada Cup, actually made me even feel better about my argument for the Olympics not necessarily being the, the be all end all. Because oh my god, how awesome was the Canada Cup growing up? It was so. It good. was great, and you know, and then in '96 they changed it to the World Cup of Hockey, and that was the last best on best tournament that the NHL played before Olympic involvement. So really, I mean, for me, I was nine years old in 1998, and. I was 13 in 02 when Canada won gold, and I was the perfect age to enjoy that. And you think of all the kids my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, those those people growing up, I mean, the Olympics were what we looked forward to. That is what we we knew as as international hockey. So it's like you said, I, I'm glad that you have you know, the, the memories of the Canada cups, I, I wish that I could have remembered it. Now I've gone back and, you know, watched documentaries and actual games that have been played from, uh, 84, 91, 87, the 87 Canada cup still widely regarded as, uh, the best international tournament ever played, but still, um, for let's say anyone under the age of 30, you know, they have no memories of that. And, and yeah. so the, the Olympics is all that they know. And I think that, you know, having this big gap isn't good for hockey. I think it's actually hurt the game. And I'm glad that they did correct this and that they are going back in 2026 and uh, in 2030. And, and like I said, McDavid will be 29 and 33 in those two events. I think he should at least be the best player in the world still in the, the 2026 Olympics. He, he'll he probably be one of the, the top three players in the world still in uh, 2030 when they go. Uh, I believe that one's going to be in France, if I am correct on that. So, uh, yeah, he'll he'll have his opportunities to to play in the Olympics. But you know, when we think back to the level McDavid was even at two years ago or six years ago, I mean, it it would have been cool to see it. And I know that you're a Crosby fan as well. This will probably be the only chance that we'll ever get to see McDavid and Crosby playing together. Uh, two years from now, and it's a shame that we didn't get to see them when Crosby was a little closer to his prime, because he'll be what thirty eight when those Olympics roll around, and you know, on the the back nine of his career for sure. At that point, you you think about if they would have went uh, in twenty eighteen when McDavid was twenty one and when Crosby was thirty, you know, that would have been as close to them both at their peak abilities as we could have possibly seen with them being a decade apart in age. It, it is a crime against hockey that there hasn't been some sort of international competition in the last few years. It is it, it definitely has hurt the game. They have not been able to showcase the talent on that stage. And that is, it's a real shame because it, it is also like, I have those memories uh, of the international tournaments and they they're cherished. I still remember the cover of the magazine I had that covered the 1991 Canada cup. Um, and it was, you know, I just knew everything about that tournament. I was reading all the rosters of all the other countries and everything. I actually had, a, I think we might have talked about this, but Kerry Taco was a, a goalie for Finland, and his son was a roommate of mine when I played for the Smith Falls Bears in the CJHL. Oh, wow. um, so nice. that was that was really neat. And, you know, I knew who he was, like, uh, just because of that magazine. Um so to, to have the kids grow, like you said, you, you come in, there's a Olympics and we win gold. And then there's another one, the golden goal. And then all of a sudden there's nothing like that's crappy. Like that is, you're missing out on, on real opportunities and real memories there that uh, kids will take with them and, and grow their love of the sport. It's, it's, a, it is is a crime against hockey that there hasn't been something. So in that sense, I'm very excited that we are going back to the Olympics and at least having that, uh, 
having that stage and that drama and that performance for to get to get behind and come together as a country again and to to see some of the best players in the world in a different environment under a different set of circumstances with a different type of pressure and see how they perform. Absolutely. And you just look at all the talent on Canada and USA right now. I mean, seeing these two countries go head to head, I mean, that's the game I want to see the most. And uh, I mean, I just, I, I think about the talent that Canada can put out there. I mean, they could have a power play of McDavid, Crosby, McKinnon. Uh, maybe you want to throw um, another forward of... Put, I mean, any anyone you could really fill in, like Marner, Mark Stone, pick pick whoever you want, and then have like Kale McCarr as the blue liner. I mean, I, I feel like they'd have almost a fifty percent power play in that tournament. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that'd be pretty sick. Oh uh, man, to, to have the ability to call those names, uh, and and of course in those competitions, like someone's got to be fourth line. Who do you put on the fourth line? Like, what is a fourth line? At that well, line? I mean, Canada will be able to roll four lines because. I mean, they're taking 12 of the best forwards in the league. And, you know, Canada always loads up on centers for this too. So probably of their 12 forwards, I would bet that they have at least eight or nine natural centers. So, I mean, you'll have guys playing, you know, not their natural position, but you're you're so covered in, in any situation. And um, it's going to be a totally new crop of players too. Like there won't be very many hangovers from that 2014 team. I mean, really Crosby might be the only one. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what, what the roster looks like. There's been different projections that have already been made two years from now. I mean, I didn't even mention Bedard. Like what if in the next two years, Bedard (laughs) takes a big step and it's Bedard is that fourth forward out there. It's, it's going to be very lethal. This is exciting to see. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that at the Olympics. And uh, I mean, McDavid has spoke about it several times that, uh, he thinks NHL players need to be back there uh, outside of winning a Stanley Cup, winning a gold medal and representing his country is his next biggest goal in hockey. And uh, I'm looking forward to that in Italy uh, two years from now. They have a seven hour time difference from uh, Saskatoon. So uh, the games, if, if they're starting at 7 p.m. local time in Milan, that'd be about 2 a.m. my time. And be, I guess it would be about 4 a.m. Halifax time if I've got that right. <laughs> Sounds so, right. Yeah, or no, I, I, would it be the other way around? You're yeah. earlier than us. It would probably be four or five here. Yeah, I guess I guess that would make sense. So, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it'll be middle of the night games, but I'm a night owl, so I don't even mind uh, a 2 a.m. start time. So I'll still probably be live tweeting it at, at that time as well. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's awesome that, uh, that they're finally going back uh, two years from now. And uh, while we have to wait a little while longer to see the NHL players back at the Olympics, we'll get an appetizer next year as uh, there will have the four nations tournament to look forward to. Um, Josh, do you think four teams is enough or should the NHL have just brought back the World Cup of Hockey and invited six to eight countries instead? I think four is enough. I really do. I like the idea of the four nations cup. Um, Partly because I think I saw a tweet of the amount of players from each country broken down and feasibly to be competitive. I think there's only enough players to have really uh, the, the top four teams will be quite good and competitive. And then there's maybe a fifth team. I can't remember what country it was now. I'm not looking at the numbers in my head. I should have I should have had that ready. Well, but, I mean, uh, in the past, when it's been the World Cup of Hockey, they've also invited about the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Germany, um, Russia. I mean, obviously, Russia can't be there due to geopolitical issues. But, um, you know, how many of the, the best players in the world are Russian? I mean, you you think about how many players uh, in, in the Olympics, uh, Russian superstars that won't be there. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's it's a shame in that respect because you know some of the most talented players in the league, as I said, uh, come from that country. So it's a that's a, a a tough break, and maybe some people will say that that takes away from it even being uh, best on best. But in my opinion, it's still the best players from the countries who are there, and uh, it, it will be regarded as such. It's exactly. It it'll be the best players from the countries that are there. Uh, Russia would obviously be a, a fantastic team, but um, 
taking them out of the I'm not going to get into the political aspect of taking yeah. them out of the competition. Just from a feasible tournament standpoint, the team that you replace Russia with, or you know, if you look at it that way, um, not having them there isn't going to be detrimental to the overall competitiveness and value of the competition. It'll just be that there will be one less really, really good team out of a number of really, really good teams. <laughs> That's all. And you, and you have to remember the Olympics invites 12 teams. So, you know, and because Italy is the host country, they will be in the event. They're in every event. So, I mean, what happens if Italy ends up in Canada's group? I mean, that, that game could get a little bit ugly. You know, they are not regarded as, as a hockey power. And I mean, it would have probably been even worse in 2022 with China. And I will tell you, China was in Canada's division. And uh, can, <laughs> can you imagine that game two years ago? If yeah. Canada had to play China and I, there were people online kind of joking about what the score might have been. I think you could conservatively say 20 to nothing is, is a, a, a predictable score that you could actually bet on If If they didn't take their foot off the gas, they might've been able to push it to 30, nothing. Honestly, I, I feel like by the third period, they would, you know, sort of stop trying to score and, and sort of mercy them a little bit, but uh, it would have got out of hand for sure. Yeah. There wouldn't be any excitement to that game. It wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't, there wouldn't be much value brought to a game like that for anybody. Uh, not even the Chinese players. I would imagine that's, it's never fun. Uh, it, it, it would just They're be something overmatched. that would have to happen. And, and you know, I, I mean, I think that Asia is, a natural spot for the game of hockey to grow next. I mean, and China being the country probably to do it in. I mean, it's going to take them decades to build up a hockey program that can compete on the world stage. But uh, if they ever get the proper coaching and skill development there, uh, you could see China being a natural spot where they could be the, maybe the first country outside of North America or Europe to really compete uh, in the Olympics. And uh, just to, just to finish up on Russia before we, we move on, I mean, you, you think of the likes of Kucherov, Panarin, Kaprizov, Malkin, Tarasenko, Ovechkin, uh, Svechnikov, like there would be so many star players in the game that won't be going to this next Olympics. And uh, I mean, even in a world cup of hockey, if they brought back. So yeah, it, it's, it's a shame that, uh, they won't be there because I think that outside of Canada and USA, you would probably call Russia the third best hockey nation in the world still. So, I mean, that that's just uh, something that we're not going to get to see in this era. It does suck. It really does. There, there's, there would be a lot of fun. And I mean, look at the goalies. Who, who would uh, Russia's three goalies be? They oh, would boy. have, they'd have uh, Shosturkin, uh, Vasilevsky, and um, uh, why is the Islanders goalie uh, slipping my uh, <laughs> Sorokin? Uh, for, yeah, Sorokin. yeah. I mean, any of those three goalies could arguably be a starter for uh, most countries, especially Canada right now. So, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a tough break for them. But you know, like you said, I'm hoping that the four nations thing works. I, I think it's going to, you know, just serve as like a, a little appetizer for the Olympics. Just get everyone back into it. Um, get to see the the best players in the world, you know, play uh, for their countries for the first time. And, you know, one idea that I even heard floated out there was they could have just done a best of seven series between Canada and USA. Well, what would you have thought of that? <laughs> uh it's just funny because, uh, you know, the women's hockey has the rivalry series, which is right. just whatever it's USA it would have been a lot like that. Uh, that's, it's just kind of funny that an idea would be to emulate what the <laughs> women are doing to draw the, there's, <laughs> hey, you can, you can take the ideas from them too. I mean, like we talked about the, some people have been pushing for that three point system for a win for years. Uh, I don't know if the NHL will ever do that because it would impact uh, the history book so much of, you know, uh, a, a two points for a win going back over a hundred years. But I mean, there are ideas that you can still take from the women's game for sure. Yeah. And, and I, I wouldn't mind that. I, I wouldn't mind that at all. Best of seven series. I, I don't know how it would work. Like would they do it all in one shot or spread it out over the year? I don't know, but. Uh, oh, you'd have to, you'd have to do it all in that 
pretty much 10 to 14 day <laughs> period. And, you know, that was something apparently that the players were really pushing for. If you remember, um, the, the Canada Cup and World Cup of Hockey was always in August and September, going back to uh, the 70s when it started. It was always a preseason tournament. And apparently the players didn't want to give up roughly a month of their off season to have this tournament ahead of training camp. So it will be an in season tournament going forward. And I think that they could line up a nice system. If they bring back the world cup of hockey full time, you have to make it mean something. You can't go a decade plus between having this tournament, you know, have it in, um, 96 and then not bring it back till 04 and then not bring it back till 2016. If you, if you wanted to have best on best hockey every two years, you have the world cup of hockey. And then two years later, you have the winter Olympics. And then two years after the world cup of hockey and so forth and so forth. That's the way they could actually do this going forward. And it would, it would just give us like a, a hockey calendar and schedule that we would get used to. So that's what I hope that uh, we end up seeing anyway in, in the years to come. I, w- I would like that very much. I would I would look forward to those, and, and you know, like you said, it's something you can count on and count down to, and look forward to. And while there will only be four countries at the tournament next February, the Oilers should be well represented in 2025. Uh, Josh, which Oilers players do you think will be respect uh, representing their respective countries in this tournament? I was kind of looking at their roster when uh, when you proposed this question, and I like this but i didn't realize just how canada heavy the oilers actually are yeah um there's there's really not a lot of options for other countries um you have of course uh yan mark but do i think he's gonna make team sweden i don't know uh probably not um you know Derek ryan is an american uh is he is he probably gonna make is he probably gonna make uh the no, squad? i don't know so you have not one he He's not one of the 12 best American forwards. I can tell you that. Right. <laughs> right? Let's be real here. So you Even have a, Kyler a, Yamamoto, if he was on the team, wouldn't have made it. I mean, I, I think that people, if you've looked at some of the projected rosters, Canada is still better than the States, but the States lineup is pretty deadly. They, are, they have done a really nice job in their systems and their grassroots hockey growing the game and you know they've caught up in a lot of ways and they're and they're uh, you know while their lineup i mean you can argue about how close is to canada's or not but they are deep in goal too i mean uh you can have uh hellebuck and uh demko as your your two goalies and swayman as your as your third in the press box like they're going to be set (laughs) yeah yeah the goaltending issue is is significant in canada there's a it's Boy, been an issue for years of developing. Hockey. Yeah, there's I mean, a, there's a goaltender shortage in in a lot of areas. Well, I mean, do you even remember the CHL brought in that rule um, several years ago, where uh, for the import draft you weren't allowed to draft goaltenders because there was this problem developing Canadian goalies. And I, I remember the Saskatoon Blades even had a a Russian goalie years ago that was awesome. And you know, while we thought that was great, I mean that is taking a, a spot away from a Canadian kid who, you know, could be growing in that position. And, you know, all CHL teams are only allowed to have two import players as it is. And um, I guess maybe they also don't want to use one on a goaltender, but still uh, it, it is uh, something that Canada does need to resolve because when I was growing up, it seemed like all the best goalies were Canadian. And now would any Canadian goalie even be considered a top 10 goalie in the league? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's definitely uh, an area we are struggling. Um, but sorry, I, I cut you off before when you were list- making your list. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's that's fine. I love where these conversations go. The- so you were talking about Ryan and Yan, Mark, and Ekholm, and then uh, so, you, you were getting to your Canadian. Sorry. Well, that's bas- you know that's what I'm saying. Like really, like Canada is quite deep. Um, so we have a lot of players that are are, are good. You know, they're that are very good, and if they were on Team Canada, I'd be like, Yeah, I can see that. But like you said, the talent pool across the league is so strong that it's almost like I'd have to know who the people would be that are constructing the team to understand what I think maybe the types of players they would look for are. 
Um, I think that what gets lost in these types of things, you see all the talent, but you're trying to create a team, you know, so there's a lot of different types of players that will have to play different roles and you have to try and pick players that you think will fit in that role the best. So the skill wise, I mean, there's a lot of obviously very talented Edmonton Oilers there. Um, But some of the ones that are like the bubble players, there's so many play. Once you get past the top 10, there's like the next 50 are the same, you know, depending on what you're looking for. So the candidate is quite Canada in general across our roster is, is quite deep. Uh, so it will be, I, I think with most of the last 10 picks on a team, uh, uh, if someone were to create another roster where those 10 picks weren't on it, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense too. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just so hard to predict. Oh no, without a doubt. I mean, and, and you can look it up. I, there's been various lists. Sportsnet has made their prediction for Team Canada, TSN, uh, J Fresh Hockey on Twitter. I mean, you you can look it up. There's probably tons of, of lists that have already come out of, uh, you know, who they think will will be there and who won't. And there, you're going to get a lot of the same names. There will be a few that are different, but uh, generally, I think you can sort of picture it. And I mean, just I'll give you mine. I, I think McDavid is obviously a lock to make Team Canada. In fact, I think he should be the captain. Uh, he'll be 28 next year, and uh, this will be his first time that, you know, he'll have a chance to lead the next generation of Canadian superstars. And I expect he'll uh, lead the tournament in scoring as well. I think Zach Hyman has a good shot, especially if he can continue to fill the net over the next 12 months. He, he's definitely going to be one of the guys who uh, is on the bubble because he's not like a, a surefire Team Canada player. He's never had the chance to represent Canada before either, so this will be big for him. And uh, I mean, his chemistry with McDavid increases his odds too. Uh, I think Evan Bouchard grabs a spot on the blue line. He's developing into one of the elite offensive defensemen in the league, and he's only going to be better a year from now, so I'll have him in there. Uh, Stuart Skinner will at worst be the backup goalie, but he has a real chance to be the starter as well. Uh, There's not, as we talked about, an overly deep pool of top-tier Canadian goalies right now, so Skinner is very much in the mix, and uh, I've got Matthias Ekko making Team Sweden, as you also said, so I'll say five Oilers players make it in total, and and, you know that number would be even higher if this was the Olympics, because Dreisaitl would probably be the captain of Team Germany. True, true, yeah, true enough with that. Uh, I I see, I could stand behind those five for sure. Uh, Yeah. I have no arguments there. <laughs> and I want to quickly see if I can find the lineup that uh, that he made. Uh, J-, J Fresh Hockey had his roster out. Um, see if I can pull it up because he put out, I think, Canada and USA as well. So, okay. Oh, this is his 2030. Okay, I'll look here because he had his 2026 and 2030 rosters. Okay, here's a uh, here's his projected roster for uh, 2026, and this isn't gospel. This is just one list, but I thought it was pretty good. So his forwards were, uh, this, and this is in alphabetical order too, uh, not in any specific. But Adam Fantilli, Brad Marchand, Braden Point, uh, Connor Bedard, Connor McDavid, Mark Shifley, Mark Stone, Matthew Barzell, Mitch Marner, Nathan McKinnon, Robert Thomas, Sam Reinhart, Sidney Crosby, and Zach Hyman as his forwards. And on defense, he had Alex Petrangelo, Kale McCarr, Devon Taves, Dougie Hamilton, Evan Bouchard, Josh Morrissey, Noah Dobson, and Shea uh, Shea Theodore. And his goalies were Aiden Hill, Devon Levi, and Stuart Skinner. So, you know, pretty deep Canadian roster. Yeah. uh, You know, as you were, it's, it's true, and it kind of goes with what i said i looked at another roster and there were a couple of different names and i was like okay yeah i can see these and then you read your list out and there was like i said a few different names and i'm like yeah okay <laughs> yeah, i'll take that <laughs> and if you add like if if you even were to add someone like nugent hopkins to one of those lists i'd be like yeah, yeah. okay i'd do and, that and you, you know, know a lot of this will also be who's playing the best at the time they have to name it i I believe the Olympic rosters have to be named on New Year's Eve uh, before the the February tournament. So it'd be like uh, New Year's Eve of 2025. They have to be submitted by. So it it's still, you know, like we said, almost two years off. 
uh, and a lot will change. You know, some player might really take a big step forward in that time. Another player might fall back. Uh, I'll give you his Team USA roster too while I'm have it. So here are the forwards. Alex DeBrinkett, Austin Matthews, Brady Kachuk, Brock Besser, Clayton Keller, Dylan Larkin, JT Miller, Jack Eichel, Jack Hughes, Jake Gensel, Jason Robertson, Kyle Connor, Matthew Kachuk, and Tage Thompson. And the defense, Adam Fox, Brock Faber, Charlie McAvoy, Jacob Slavin, Jake Sanderson, Luke Hughes, Quinn Hughes, and Zach Warinsky. And in goal, he has Connor Hellebuck, Jake Ottinger, and Thatcher Demko. And I forgot Ottinger when I was making my list before. So, I mean, those th- those yeah. three guys are all elite goalies. And um, like I said, I give the edge to USA in goal on defense. It's probably pretty close, uh, but for the forwards, I still think Canada's forwards are better than the U.S. So um, it it definitely won't be a situation in the past where Canada is the overwhelming favorites. I think USA has closed the gap, but Canada is still the best hockey nation in the world, and I would take them to win the gold in that Olympics. I'm taking Canada every time. (laughs) But we could see that as the gold medal game, and I mean, that would be awesome. We've seen it twice before in 2002 and 2010, so uh, hopefully we get it again in 2026, and hopefully that one ends the same way the previous two did as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly. Um, All right, uh, let's shift focus to the Edmonton Oilers now, who are set to return from their nine-day break tomorrow night against the defending Stanley Cup champion Vegas Golden Knights. And history is on the line as the Oilers look to match the NHL record for the longest winning streak at 17 games, which was set by the Pittsburgh Penguins back in 1992-93. Josh, do you think the extended break will help the Oilers or hurt them as they look to tie a 31-year-old record tomorrow? I mean, I'm a type of guy that doesn't want the break. I would want to keep going. Some players, it doesn't really matter to them. I think that if they don't, get the record then we can blame it on the break but uh, i i i don't i don't come into this game with any less of an expectation of winning than i had before the break you know what i mean like i just think it's it's unfortunate timing uh you'd like to just see them carry on where they're on a bit of a roll but uh i just think you know the nhl is such that anyone's going to win on any given night i think you could blame a lot of factors i don't necessarily think the break is is either a positive or a negative thing it's just something that happened and i can't wait for the game and i can't imagine anybody not watching it or tuning in no i think this is going to be the most highly anticipated game on the nhl schedule this week i mean not only are the Oilers and Golden Knights divisional rivals and teams that played in the playoffs last year. But the Oilers have a chance to get some revenge against the team that knocked them out in their own building and tie this NHL record. And you know that the Golden Knights are going to be wanting to look to snap this record. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot on the line and uh, I won't be heartbroken if they don't get it because winning 16 games is already incredible and they've done better than anyone expected during this run and got themselves back into a position where they're not only look like a lock to make the playoffs, but they have a real shot at still getting the the second spot in the Pacific. So that's the most important thing, but you know, just for the pride of, of holding this record or at least tying it, Um, it would be great to see them do it. And there's no better team that you'd probably want them to beat other than maybe the flames than, um, than beating the the golden Knights to get it. So for that reason, I'm really hoping that they, they do beat them tomorrow. And uh, if they do win, uh, that sets up a great opportunity to break the record on Friday night because they're playing the lowly Anaheim ducks. So I, I think (laughs) if, if they are able to get by Vegas, then the chance of them holding the record will be uh, very strong. And I mean, they have to play LA the night after that. So maybe that's the night just playing on back to back nights that it, it, it does come to an end. But uh, if they're able to get by Vegas, and let's hope that they do, there's a really good chance that they can break the Penguins' record in Anaheim. Yeah, uh, these streaks are so funny. I just think back to, this is going to be a throwback to 1998, I think, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, 1998-99, when I was playing junior hockey, uh, a team called the Charlottetown Abbeys went on a, a May, I think it was 31 or 32 or something games winning streak. And this is a league that's uh, 
I don't know, like a 64 game schedule or something like that. So they won 50% of their games in a row. Like, and I just remember this mostly because we happened to be the team, the Truro Bearcats <laughs> that ended their streak. They came to Truro and we beat them five, one on home ice. And it was just one of those nights where like, I remember scoring a goal that game. I remember it clear as if I just scored it <laughs> tonight uh, where I was skating down on a one-on-one and I was forced wide and I actually fell down and I just kind of threw the puck towards the net from the hash marks on my stomach. And the next thing you know, people are celebrating around me and I was kind of like, what that went in? Like, really? <laughs> like it was just one of those nights where, you know, the fates were, were saying the streak was going to end and it didn't matter how good or bad we played or whatever. It was just the luck of the draw. Right. So anything, Anything can happen in, in these games. Uh, any, the NHL parody is already so so good, um, and you know it just it just takes one stupid bounce here or there to to end history. So you know I'm 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 going in with expectations and excitement and anticipation, but like you said, I won't be overly disappointed if it doesn't happen uh, because I mean they've done what they've needed to do goal. over the, this you know 16 game streak. They've They've corrected uh, what they what, what they got off to that terrible start. They they've put themselves back in a, a position where uh, playoffs are not only looking like a, a maybe but a, a sure thing at this point, and uh, with even higher aspirations. So that's the most important thing. But if they can also set the record on the side, that's nice too. Yeah, exactly. It'll just be a feather uh, in the cap. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, what do you think? has been the single most impressive part of this historic 16 game winning streak that started back on December 21st. Well, I think it's it's really just how they're winning, which is, isn't, I'm not just going to sit here and say how they're winning. It's one way. It's how they're winning different ways each time, how they've been able to hold teams to such few goals and, and in general, such scoring chances, really high danger scoring chances. Uh, it's it's just been a completely different night and day where they uh, at the start of the year they just found ways to lose uh, and then now they're just finding ways to win and it's not like you're just oh good the power play went six for seven tonight you know every night or whatever it is it's it's always something unique there's always a different hero that's what I really love about it. Uh, there's just always something different you take away from each game that it, it's its own. It's a 16 game win streak, but every one of those wins is their own unique little mini battle that we've won and, and learned something about this team and grown and, and we're seeing different line combinations and we've seen roster changes and all this and nothing seems to matter. They just seem to be on sort of autopilot right now, which is uh, not something we're used to. No, I mean, like you said, the depth scoring has stepped up. We already talked about Ryan McLeod and Warren Fogle a little earlier in the podcast. And, you know, it's nice that you don't have to rely on 97 and 29 to carry the load every single night. And, uh, I mean, you could you could point to that. You could also say, you know, Skinner giving the team elite goaltending, uh, going undefeated in January, first time in Oilers history where they've swept an entire month. Um, but I, I think if I had to single out one thing that's been the most impressive during this run, it's uh, the improvement in their defensive play and penalty killing. I mean, it's been dramatic from where they were earlier in the season. And I always said the Oilers only need to be average or slightly above average defensively because they have the firepower to outscore their problems. But when you can have a team that's excellent defensively and you have all the offensive weapons that the Oilers do, that is is a recipe for a Stanley Cup winner. And let's just hope that this can continue, even if it falls back a little bit, where they're not at this pace the rest of the way. If they can just keep these defensive habits, these good habits in their game, they're going to be set up really well for the playoffs. I mean, uh, they've allowed one or fewer goals in eight of the wins and two or fewer goals in 14 consecutive games. So (laughs) right now, since... December 21st, the Oilers have averaged 1.5 goals against per game, which is the best in the league. Now, like we said, we're not, they're not going to stay under two goals a game over the final 38 games of the season. But I think that we're seeing a lot of, like we said, good habits creeping in, a lot of fundamentals that uh, Knobloch has brought to this team in a short time that uh, are going to set them up for success because, like we said, this was an area that 
has been probably one of their biggest flaws for years is is taking care of their own end. And the fact that they look like that they've cleaned that area up now is a huge positive for this team. It it just changes everything because it's it's one thing, like you said, to have the firepower to score four and five goals a night. It's Which they another... could. Last year they averaged right around four goals a game. I mean, that was what we came to expect from this team. And there were tons of games where they had five or six goals, seven goals, eight goals. But, you know, now that you don't need to score seven or eight goals, you know, all the time, and you can rely on your defense to hold leads and you can win those three, two games. That is, you know, the kind of hockey that they're going to be playing more often than not down the stretch and into the playoffs. That's, that's the mental part of it. Knowing that you no longer have to score four goals almost makes it easy. Like it's, it's no panic if you haven't scored in the first period uh, or even, you know, halfway through the second period, because you know, it doesn't really matter because you haven't given up a whole lot. And eventually you are going to find a way to score. Uh, whether that's two goals or four goals or six goals, none of that really matters as long as you're still giving up under three, you know, and that's just not something that you could ever really depend on. It's almost like you felt like you had to get uh, in front just to be safe a little bit. Um, uh, but the this is this is completely uh, relaxed. That's what the, kind of the streak is, is, it's been a lot more comforting almost in a way because yeah. you're, there's no panic. Like you don't, you know, we haven't scored yet or we don't have that many shots yet. And it's like, who cares? It's, I mean, there's been games. Like I think back to the, the Ottawa game in Edmonton or when the Oilers were in Montreal, uh, those were games where they went into the third period with, uh, in, in the, the game against the Ottawa, they scored late in the second period, but they went almost the full 40 minutes without a goal. And the one in Montreal, uh, they scored in the first minute of the third period, so roughly about the same, just over 40 minutes without scoring. And they came back in the third period, got the job done, and got the win. So it just shows that like, even though they haven't jumped out to these early leads, you know that eventually it's going to come. And as long as you play your strong defensive systems, then you know, you're going to be safe in those games. Yeah, and it's it's very promising for the playoffs that they've been able to... You, you just say, oh, they've had three or four games where it's gone well, and they'll just fall back to whatever they were doing. This seems like it's here to stay. Yeah. Even if they end up losing and don't get the streak, it's. I know the numbers aren't really sustainable, but the defensive structure and the commitment to it as a team is sustainable. I, I really believe that they're on to something here where it's not just been luck. They, they have found a way to neutralize the, the high danger chances against and allowed everyone to settle into games before you even understand what the feel of the game is. That is sustainable. If, um, so whether some nights the other team just crack through and they do get three or four, uh, I've come to expect uh, and with good reason, like they've given me a reason to believe that that problem is officially solved and we can, you know, hope to have more games than not where it's three or less against yeah. And just looking at their schedule in February, I'll, I'll try to be as you know unbiased as I can in, in this prediction. But okay, let's just say, let's say loss to Vegas, win over Anaheim. We'll say a loss to LA, win over Detroit, win over St. Louis, loss to Dallas, win over the Coyotes, loss to Boston, win over Minnesota, win over Calgary, win over LA, win over St. Louis. Like. Count the wins there out of 12 games. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Like they could realistically go eight and four this month, and that would be fine still because you're still making up ground in the standings. You four games over 500 this month. Eight and four is a fine month. You're, you don't have to go 12 and 0 every, every single month. So, I mean, as long as they're still having a good record like that, they're going to be fine down the stretch. Yeah. And none of the games that you, mentioned or, or like oh yeah no that's that's a bit of an ask isn't it no it's a, that's a very realistic i gave uh, the scenario. oilers a loss to every team that was ahead of them in the standings and one to even la who's below them in the standings just because it's on the back half of back-to-backs so as long as they win the, if they win the games of the teams who are below them in the standings then they'll go at minimum eight and four this month yeah, uh, and that's that's fine. And when you think about it, like I know some people have been trying to sort of downplay the streak because of the level of competition. But 
when the streak started, the Oilers were 20. They name all the teams and the places they're in that they play. When the Oilers played, started it, they were in 28th place or whatever it was. Like It's not like they were top 10 teams and now they're just picking on the lower half of the league. They were the lower half of the league. They All those teams, when, when they played them, were better than them. You know, it's not like... It's not and like you have to look at how players. things are going. Like, sure, okay, they beat the Rangers, you know, were uh, one of the top teams in the league. They were, I think they were in first place in, in the East at the time when they beat them. And that was on the second half of back-to-backs against the Devils after a really, you know, gutty, come-from-behind win the night before. Uh, you, you look at when they played L.A. L.A. was rolling when they beat yeah. them in late December. And the Oilers sort of sent them into a tailspin that led to them going on a big losing streak and end up firing their coach. Uh, I mean, when the Flyers came, they, now the Flyers have kind of lost a few since then, but the Flyers were still one of the top teams in the East when they played them at that time. Uh, even the Flames, they beat the Flames a couple weeks ago. The Flames were on a four-game winning streak. So you have to look at perspective of not where they are in the standings right now, but where they were when the Oilers played them. And I, I don't know why someone's trying to diminish it. Like, a 16-game heater is a 16-game heater. I mean... <laughs> You can, there, sure, there's some noise from outside of oil country about the quality of competition they've faced, but it doesn't matter who they are. You beat 16 NHL teams in a row. I, I don't know if you could beat the San Jose Sharks 16 teams t- times in a row for most teams. Eventually, you fi- figure out that they're going to win at least one of those. Exactly. And this team is the same team that lost to the Sharks earlier in the yeah. year. Right? Like it's not like, like I said, it's not like they were just ripping things up and there's some all-star team that's above and beyond. And it's not like there's been a bit of an unbalanced stretch in everyone's schedules and they've never been able to accomplish what's happening here. Um, you there's know, one team, few teams. one team in the history of the game that's had a longer winning streak. Exactly. That that really puts into perspective. We might never see a run like this again. So I hope that everyone is appreciating it, and I think Oilers fans do. It's just some of the fans from, say, Vancouver or Toronto who are kind of trying to diminish it a little bit. But for me, like, y- you can't say that this isn't impressive. I-, I think even if you're not an Oilers fan, you have to look at it and say, this team has went six straight weeks without a loss. That's impressive. It's it's just there's yeah there's no way to diminish this it's impressive any way you look at it. Uh, all right, and just to wrap up the show tonight with uh, 45 games played this season, the Oilers have games in hand on every other team in the league. That means that they'll have the most congested schedule in the league the rest of the way. Uh, Josh, do you think that playing every other night on average for the next two months will help prepare the Oilers for the rigors of the Stanley Cup playoffs? or potentially cause them to burn out by playing so much hockey between now and mid-June? Again, it's it's just how you feel mentally. If we get into some injury trouble or something, then that changes things. But for the most part, uh, when you look at where the Oilers have been in the standings the last couple of years, uh, they haven't exactly sauntered into the playoffs in any one of the years. Uh, they've had to go on some pretty significant you know, second-half runs to get where they were. I mean, last uh, year they had five regulation losses in the second half of the season. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and they still couldn't catch uh, a couple of the other teams uh, in their own. Oh, division. I mean, if Vegas would have lost that last game of their regular season, Edmonton would have been first place in the Western conference. It would have been the first time they they've done that since 1987. And it shows you like even that incredible run they went on still didn't quite get them there. But uh, they ended the season on a 14-0-1 run. And if you want to include that first round against the Kings, all of the Kings' wins in that series, both of them, were in overtime. So the Oilers actually went 21 consecutive games without a regulation loss. Yeah, it's just incredible what they've been able to do. Uh, And so I don't see the fact that they're going to be playing a lot of hockey uh, in, in in a short period, I don't think that that's going to matter depending on what kind of vibe is around the team. Uh, 
we may be in a spot if we can continue to have like, you know, this streak and then to have a month like you just talked about in February of eight and four and things, we might be at a luxury where we actually get to rest players or diminish their ice time significantly, which is kind of unheard of for the Edmonton Oilers heading into the playoffs. So in, in that sense, I think, you know, if, if things are going well, like I said, I'm the type of person that wants to play as much hockey as possible anyway. I don't want to wait. I don't want to have those gaps. I just want to, you know, play this game and move on to the next yeah. one. I think there there's some uh, some benefit to that if it's the right kind of team. And I think the way the Oilers are right now, I think they'd be the right kind of team that can handle that and sort of use it to their advantage heading into the playoffs as opposed to having it uh, hurt their chances. And even when the regular season ends for the Oilers on April 18th, uh, which is also the anniversary of uh, the, the day they won the lottery to get Connor McDavid. It'll be the ninth anniversary this year. Um, and, and it's also April 18th was the, the day that Wayne Gretzky retired in 1999. So a little two trivia facts for you there. Um, yeah, crazy how it was the same day, right? <laughs> oh my God. And you know that. Like you're a legend and, to these things. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Gretzky has said in an interview that his wife, Janet, uh, predicted that the Oilers were going to win the lottery in 2015 because she said that April 18th is just a special day uh, in your career and also a special day you know, for Oilers fans uh, you know, because of what he means to the franchise. And she said, I just think it's going to be a good luck day for the Oilers. And uh, lo and behold, they ended up winning the lottery that day. So uh, yeah, that is the day that the regular season ends this year uh, with a game, I believe, against the Colorado Avalanche. And they're still going to have like a three or four day break before the playoffs start. So there will be a little bit of rest time in there. And, you know, like we said, because the team is playing as well as they are, they don't need to run McDavid and Dreisaitl out there 24 and 25 minutes a night. So hopefully, you know, if you do play a team that's near the bottom of the league, you can cut back their minutes and give them a 17-minute night. And, you know, by by doing that, you're, you're saving their legs a little bit more come playoff time. Exactly. Uh, it's, like I said, it's kind of an unheard of luxury for the Oilers if we can get to that point. And I think we're well on the way to setting ourselves up to do that. So some of these back-to-backs or, you know, some of these quick turnaround games, I don't, I don't think it's going to matter a whole lot. For sure. And Josh, just before we call it a night, um, where can people follow you? And do you have anything coming up at uh, Tough Call Pod? Yeah. Uh, so I, you can follow me on YouTube, the Tough Call YouTube channel. Just search Tough Call. Uh, I reached a milestone this year. Uh, last year, I was at 1,000 followers. And by Christmas time this year, I was at 4,000 followers so wow. or subscribers. So it's, it's been a great year for me. And uh, so, yeah, you can find me on my YouTube Tough Call and uh, my podcast. My actual podcast is on the Heavy Hockey Network YouTube site. Um, so I do a video podcast now. So you can find my podcast at Heavy Hockey YouTube channel. So subscribe there. And, of course, you can find me on uh, Twitter. I'll always call it Twitter. That's what me it too. is. Me <laughs> At Tough Call Pod. And, uh, you know, I have a Facebook page and an Instagram account as well, where you'll, you'll f- find some of my musings, uh, as I'm watching games, I'll live tweet or put out messages, things like that discussions. Uh, so I'm more than just videos, but my YouTube channel is kind of my, my niche where I, where I post most of my stuff and then I'll leave comments on social media. And of course, come check out heavy hockey.com for my articles but also for all the writers articles there there's some really good stuff there so uh, you can find me and find everyone else at the heavy hockey network there too definitely and uh, i said earlier in the podcast congrats on the coach of the month award also congrats to you on hitting four thousand subscribers and you know if you continue at that rate you know we might be talking about ten thousand subscribers a year from now so uh, just, you know, keep growing and, you know, you've been an awesome part of the heavy hockey network. I know everyone thinks that. So, uh, just great to have you a part of the team, man. Thank you very much. I love this team. You guys are a, gr- a great fun group and, uh, we have some interesting chats in our group chat all the time. Yeah. The only thing I wish is that you were coming out for the heavy hockey showdown later this month. Uh, that would have been awesome. That killed me when I couldn't figure out a way to do it. Uh, it works out 
Well, because it's the weekend of my son's playoffs anyway, so yeah. I probably would have had to skip out. But uh, yeah. I will, I will make it out some someday. <laughs> we will I, meet. I want while Connor McDavid is in his prime, you to make it out and experience an Edmonton Oilers game in Rogers Place. I think it's something that you will cherish forever, man. I can tell you, I only get to go to about three or four games a year, um, but. You know, I'm, and I'm only a five-hour drive away. I, luckily, this year um, I'm going to try to make it to I think one extra one, and uh, that's because there's two games that uh, the Oilers are playing against uh, the Wild and Flames the weekend of the, the Heavy Hockey Showdown. So I'll be going to both of those, and uh, I mean I had the chance to go to the Heritage Classic back in October, which was awesome too. So, uh, but yeah, I want you to experience that in Edmonton. Uh, it's different, I'm sure, than seeing it on the ro- the Oilers on the road. Um, you know, even if you're seeing it in some pretty cool buildings, uh, getting to be a part of just all the Oilers fans uh, supporting the team, it's uh, it's something that would have been cool. And um, we'll we'll get you into one of these heavy hockey showdowns eventually. I'm sure you're probably going to be one of the best players there too. So uh, from that from that perspective, it'd be great as well. See, that's the other thing. I like to keep the mystique going. I like people to still believe that. Eventually, if I do make it out to one of these games, you guys will all see that that's not true. So I like to keep that reputation and the mystique and the mystery yeah. of my style of play. Uh, I like I like to keep that as a legend as opposed to the reality. Well, I know you played at a higher <laughs> level than I did. So <laughs> you know, you know, I'll at least ask to be on your line and you can uh, carry me a little bit as I'm cherry picking at the red line looking for that breakaway pass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. I'd, I'd find you. Awesome. All right, Josh. Well, once again, thanks for being on the show. Looking forward to doing this again sometime. All right. Yes. Thank you. Anytime. It's been, pl- been a pleasure. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Eric J. Freeze, and you can all fo- and follow this podcast at 99 Forever Pod. Josh, have a good night. You too. So for Josh Bolton, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out.